Johnny Cash was dead on the floor. And it was all Ronnie Hawkins' fault. Ronnie Hawkins, the hard-driving Canadian rockabilly hellraiser, singer of the Hawks, the man who told his young guitarist Robbie Robertson in his pitch to get him to join his band, you won't make much money, but you'll get more pussy than Sinatra, had, it seemed, drunk and drugged his friend Johnny Cash into an early grave, pretty much to the surprise of no one. Despite Johnny's attempt at sobriety and fidelity a couple months prior, he was back to his old ways. Pills, booze, June Carter. He was a man possessed, bent on self-destruction, and Ronnie Hawkins was the perfect wingman for such a mission. Following a semi-disastrous show earlier in the evening, the two set about to party. At some point, Ronnie took off and Johnny fell into a stupor. He was found the following morning, face down on the floor of his motorhome in the parking lot of the Toronto Four Seasons, without a pulse. And at the time in the music industry, Johnny Cash was a liability. Promoters knew he'd pack him in, but they figured he was 50-50 on whether or not he'd show up sober enough to play. His manager, Sal Holliff, was doing everything he could to outrun Johnny's ever-deteriorating professional reputation. Managing the fallout from the bust in El Paso, the trial surrounding the fire at Los Padres, the long string of canceled concerts due to Johnny's drug and alcohol use, and of course, covering up the car crash in Nashville, the one where Johnny totaled June Carter's Cadillac. Saul had to scramble to keep the details of the crash and Johnny and June's affair under wraps and out of the newspapers. Somehow, Saul's hustle always kept it so Johnny Cash would live to see another day. But on that morning in Toronto on March 19th, 1966, they both seemed out of options. Johnny Cash had no pulse and no one had any answers. Where were his pill stash? What should they do? Who should they call? Where should they go? They could go to the hospital, but that would mean making the overdose public and thus driving the final nail into the coffin that was Johnny Cash's career at the moment. And they could say fuck it and try to revive Johnny themselves and head to the next show. But that was in the States, in Rochester, New York. So that meant crossing the border and subjecting Saul and the rest of Johnny's entourage to a custom search and risking the discovery of what was believed to be an ample supply of Johnny's illegal drugs and thus jail for a lot of them. Either way, they were screwed. So they said, fuck it, the show must go on. And they headed to the border. They endeavored to bring Johnny back to consciousness, slapping him about the face, yelling at him, pounding his chest until by some stroke of dumb luck, they were able to generate some signs of life. Minimal as they were, a twitch of the eyelid, a moan, a labored cough. It was enough for them to press on. And they stashed a prone Johnny Cash under a pile of dirty laundry and miraculously made it through customs without being searched. Soon enough, they were able to fully revive Johnny. They made it to Rochester in time for the show, and with Johnny's heartbeat now ticking again at a normal pace, and with the benefit of a couple hours of forced sobriety, Johnny Cash waltzed onto the stage and delivered a transformative performance. It was nothing short of a miracle. It was inspired, just like Johnny's love for his touring mate, June Carter. That year, in 1966, Johnny's wife Vivian filed for divorce, a request Johnny was happy to oblige. Also that year, June Carter formally divorced professional badass Edwin Rip Nix, a former football player, race car driver, and cop. Johnny and June were finally able to be with one another. Not that anything had really stopped them before, but now they were able to be out in the open about it. And now, with June's support, or more likely with the prospect of some sort of real future with June, the woman of his dreams, Johnny Cash took a sincere swing at sobriety and it stuck. With a clear head, his next move was to take his career to the next level. He needed a hit. Popular music was evolving at a fevered pitch. Dylan had gone electric. The Beatles were going psychedelic. And if Johnny Cash didn't make some sort of new musical statement, he was going nowhere. He had an idea, a collaboration of sorts, with murderers, rapists, bank robbers, and an assortment of men just like himself. Bad, bad men who used to move fast, but weren't going nowhere. A captive audience of bag men, second story men, wheel men, confidence men, men out on the margins, men with no direction home, men who played with fire, Folsom prison men. Johnny's record label, Columbia Records, wasn't having any of it, but Johnny went through with the plan to record a live show for an album release at the storied prison he'd written about in his 1955 Sun Records release, Folsom Prison Blues. Since then, 
Johnny had been written to from countless prisoners who identified with not only his music, but with his fast living, sometimes criminal behavior. Just like them, Johnny Cash had stripes. Johnny also had empathy. He felt for the prisoners. He knew what they were up against, and he knew the energy he'd bring to a live show for them would be transformative, and thus, worthy of getting down on tape. Against Columbia's wishes, Johnny went ahead with the project. The proof is in the performance. What you hear on record on Johnny Cash's At Folsom Prison is unlike any other pop music live record. The excitement from the audience, the result of a truly impassioned performance by Johnny Cash and his band, the Tennessee Three, plus Carl Perkins on guitar and June Carter on backing vocals, is palpable and infectious. During the set, Johnny was Johnny. He was inspired and inspiring. He cajoled the inmates. He paraded June, a beautiful woman, on stage, the likes of which some of the men in the audience hadn't seen in the flesh in years. In Cocaine Blues, a song where the main character snorts a mountain of coke and kills his cheating wife after a bad night in Juarez, Mexico, Johnny changed the lyric, I shot my woman down, to I shot that bad bitch down. Unsurprisingly, the prisoners went nuts. There he was, the man in black, Johnny Cash, in a maximum security prison, surrounded by machine guns and felons, with the woman he loved, skirting danger, risking it to make the album that would define him. The results were undeniable. The record went to number one on the country charts, but more importantly, and totally on brand for the man in black, it hit number 13 on the pop charts. Upon its release, the album was hailed critically, and to this day has become a cultural landmark of sorts, a piece of music that is much more than a piece of music. It's social commentary. It's a fast thrill. It's a swing in the face of authority. It's pure Johnny Cash. It redefined him as something more than just another hard-living country artist and reignited his career, exactly as he talked. A couple months after the Folsom performance, Johnny proposed to June on stage in front of 7,000 people at the London Ice House in London, Ontario. June said yes, finally, after multiple previous proposals from Johnny, and the two were married in a fever on March 1st, 1968. Special thanks to Jonathan Holliff. Jonathan's dad, Saul Holliff, used to manage Johnny Cash. And Jonathan reached out to me about a year ago and generously offered me access to his dad's files on Johnny. So cool of him. Thank you, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. Also, Jonathan made a documentary about his dad and Johnny called My Father and the Man in Black, which you should check out. It's awesome. I believe it even qualified for an Oscar. So get on the internet and seek that out. Disgraceland is produced by myself for Double Elvis Media in partnership with iHeartRadio. Sources for this episode are available on my website, as are the sources for all episodes. That's www.disgracelandpod.com.